Well, welcome back, everyone. Uh, as I said, we're happy things are going well. I put on a collared shirt for the first time in two months, so I'm, I'm glad it still works. Uh, our, our next panel, I think, is, is very, very exciting and, and personally gratifying for, for me to introduce uh, and, and discuss this important topic with this group. If you look at the title, Innovation and Pain Management Delivery as a Response to Opioid Misuse and Overdose and COVID. So we hit a lot of exciting words, innovation, uh, opioids, that's always something everybody wants to talk about. Uh, and then you'll notice we are talking about COVID because COVID will change things uh, for the future on. Uh, I, we're gonna have to learn to do things differently. If we, if we thought things couldn't get any more complicated, here comes COVID. Um, and we're going to hear from some, some very inspirational uh, leaders uh, from the state of West Virginia. And I, I think if, if you were not uh, under a rock in communicado uh, on a desert island uh, for the past 10 years, you're, you're tracking the challenges facing the nation when it relates to opioids. And we've already stated that uh, a lot of us believe, uh, certainly here, uh, that these problems with opioids are rooted uh, deeply in, in how pain is, is discussed and measured and treated and all sorts of areas beyond that. Uh, much of like we're witnessing with, with COVID now, um, the impact of the opioid challenges in the nation have varied across geography uh, and health risk categories and socioeconomic groups. Uh, several years ago, our DOD team of uh, PANIACs, as we like to call ourselves, uh, was introduced to an incredible team from West Virginia University. Uh, due to the role that WVU plays in the health and well being for the entire state, and I never understood it until I met this group and, and traveled to, to West Virginia, uh, they were shouldering a lot of the burden of the state's opioid response. Uh, when we met them, they were already well on their way to doing uh, all sorts of great things, but they were still uh, very curious if there was anything they were missing, if there were things they could uh, do better and faster. Uh, they weren't interested in recreating anything that, that already existed. And so we started a, a, an ongoing multi-year relationship, uh, sharing best practices, uh, looking at things that could be implemented in the state, uh, at the university health system um, to learn from what the, happened in the, the DOD and the VA. Um, in the military, we often gauge the importance of any visiting delegation by the, the rank of those assigned to the team. And in the case of the WVU team that met us that, that first day out our, our offices outside of Washington, um, the state and the university couldn't have communicated a, a greater commitment to this issue. Uh, the team was led by the first presenter on the panel. He is certainly their general, uh, and, I, and I'm happy to introduce uh, Dr. Marsh right now. Um, Clay Marsh is the West Virginia University's chief health officer, and he serves as a member of the WVU president's leadership team, and he's all about leadership. As the WVU's Vice President for Health Sciences, he oversees five health science schools, three health campuses. As Executive Dean, he's the leader of the WVU School of Medicine. Prior to his appointment at WVU, uh, back in 2014, he served as a Senior Associate Vice President and Chief Innovation Officer, and the leader in personalized medicine at, I guess it's called The Ohio State University's Blexer Medical Center. Dr. Marsh is a scholar, he's a clinician, an innovator, he's an advocate for the human race like I've never seen. Um, he will begin the panel presentation by orienting all of you to the challenges facing his state and provide some insight on how WVU is going to lead and innovate their way out of the, uh, the challenges they find themselves in right now. So I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Marsh. Kevin, thank you for the way, way too generous introduction. So it's really wonderful to be with everyone. And I want to take uh, just a few minutes to talk about our strategy to try to help our people, but also I wanna talk a little bit about the state of our field 
and the state of our healers and, and perhaps some opportunities for our healers to be healed. You know, Dr. Klingler talked about a whole approach. And, and I want to focus on the word whole, W-H-O-L-E. So the root word of health is hail, H-A-L, which is also the root word of whole, uh, holy and holistic, and, and it means whole. And ultimately, what we are trying to do is trying to find opportunities for us to not just do things to people, but help people um, get better, help people heal. And, and, and I would just like to take a real quick aside to say that I think as we are trying to help others heal, it's really important for us to heal ourselves because through the, the, the business models of medicine where we are asked to see more people and submit more bills and, and do things faster and, and have a longer and longer list of things to do, we have to remember really our foundational purpose in, in starting in medicine is to help others heal. The Sufi poet Rumi said, the wound is where the light enters. And instead of looking at how we can suppress pain, how we can try to mask pain, even if we initially thought as a sixth vital sign that that was important, it is important for us to lean into pain. Uh, the author Scott Peck said, life is hard, well, I challenge that. I think life is what you make it. And so as we look at how we want to focus on helping our providers heal and looking at how we want to help our patients heal, we need to see the whole person. We, just, we don't need to see just a problem list in front of them, but we need to see what makes people tick. And, and as we are looking for the best partners anywhere, and, and I think that Kevin gave uh, way too generous an introduction because I would say that the key to any one of our success is who we interact with. You know, Moses Naim, who is the brilliant Venezuelan author, wrote a book called The End of Power. And he talked about the power is not your position. It's not your bank account. It's your network. It's the people you know. And as we started to look for the best people anywhere to help our patients, to help our clinicians do the right thing for our people, then we found DV SIPM, the Department of Defense VA Center for Integrated Pain Management, and we met Kevin Galloway. And we met uh, former Army Surgeon General Eric Schumacher. And we met Colonel Tripp Buckmeyer. And we met people that were committed to the mission, committed to the service. And we were merely borrowing from the great work that they did. And they were so generous and they didn't ask for credit. And I think that they really exemplify the best of all of us. Like Harry Truman said, it's great to see what you can accomplish when, when you're not worried about who gets the credit. And we start to see pain as not only a syndrome that needs something to be done for it, but we see pain as a situation in which people are hurting. It's dimensional. And instead of seeing pain as a qualitative or quantitative metric, we should look at the functional outcomes of people with pain. And I think that really us taking on the DVS, DVPRS, the, the Defense Department of uh, Defense and Veterans Pain Rating Scale that we'll hear about from our other two presenters who do all the work. I'm, I'm just here uh, to, to provide the background story. Then you'll understand how powerful this relationship has been for us and, and for our people. You know, West Virginia has led the nation in almost every category that's been bad. We lead the nation in deaths from cancer and obesity and, and, and smoking rates of pregnant women and minors. But we used to lead and be worse than the nation in our purpose, but that's not true anymore. We've redefined our purpose. Eric Ayer, the wonderful journalist for the Charleston Gazette, won a Pulitzer Prize for recounting the impact of drugs in West Virginia. And we, led the, we have led the nation in, in, in deaths from overdose and suicide. And during a six year period of time, uh, drug manufacturers shipped uh, over 780 million uh, opioids into West Virginia, enough for 433 pills per every patient. And when we look at West Virginia, that used to be a place that, that mined the coal to build the steel to fight the wars. And West Virginia did stand in and fought all the wars. We have the fourth highest per capita veteran population in the country. And West Virginia uh, used to have Welch, West Virginia, be one of the highest per capita richest cities in this country because of the price of steel. 
we attracted immigrants who risked their lives to go underground and, and, and to support our country. And then all of a sudden that wasn't good enough anymore. And people started to look at West Virginia and said, why haven't you invested in business and education? And, and why has the world left you behind? And ultimately our people started to inculcate those stories themselves. The stories that other people said about us became the story that we told about ourselves and our mindset flip from abundance to scarcity, from love to fear. And ultimately, as we are now refocusing um, on the Phoenix rising that is West Virginia, we know that we have what Tom Friedman said was the difference in, in, in outcomes, which he said that the outcome difference in America is not the coast versus the middle or the rich versus the poor, it's the weak communities versus the strong communities. And our people haven't forgotten how to care about each other. Somebody said that, you know, you're in West Virginia because when you break down on the side of the road, everybody stops. And we have a lot of smart people in West Virginia. And as we see our future, we see it to be bright. You know, we know that in medicine that we've gotten off track. We spend uh, almost twice as much money as the next country in the world, and we get next to last outcomes of all westernized countries. Uh, we are getting so expensive that our country may not be able to afford to fund our healthcare system, and we rescue people from failure. That's what we do over and over again. But wouldn't it be great if we help people prevent failure? If we started to look at the traumas that are experienced in childhood and we help people get the resilience, find the love, show the caring. You know, it's interesting that Apple did Project Aristotle, looked at their best companies of all their production or their best groups of, of all their production. And they didn't ask which ones were happiest. They said, which ones did the best? Which ones produced the most? And they found that the only feature of those groups different was higher degrees of psychological safety. And if you think about the, um, the, the Maslow's hierarchy of human needs, the foundation one is physiology. We have to be able to breathe and all that. But the second one is safety, psychological and physical. And then it's love and self-esteem and self-actualization. And ultimately, really what we're talking about is not a technical set of solutions, but it's a change in our mindset. It's a change from going from scarcity to abundance. You know, for many of us, we would say, wow, I would love to see a miracle. But in the Huffington Post, it was written that if you look at the odds against any one of us being ourselves, it's 10 to the 2,640,000th power. It is impossible, yet here we are. You want to see a miracle? Look in the mirror. The average lottery winner, less happy than the average person. The average person surviving a life-threatening illness, happier than the average person. A uh, Buddhist koan uh, teaching uh, talks about a student and a master. And the student asks the master, what happens from when you become enlightened? And the master says, before enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. After enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. So it's not about what we do, it's about how we are, how we see things. And I think that this partnership has allowed us to see the whole person. You know, the, the saying namaste, which we say in yoga and, and other elements, means, as I understand it, the divine in me recognizes the divine in you. All of us equal. So for you out there who help other people's pain, who help other people heal, I wish the same to you. And I'll leave you with namaste. Thank you, Kevin. All right. That is uh, just what I knew we were going to get. Thank you so much. And uh, we're going to transition from the, the very high level uh, view of things to down in the trenches uh, with our next presenter. And uh, Rick is uh, big liaison. Antti is the director of the WVU uh, Medicine Center for Integrative Pain Management, the CIPA. So you notice some themes here. They were, were carrying on the brand. Rick's an anesthesiologist for the School of Medicine. Uh, he specializes in chronic pain management. He's certified in both uh, by the American uh, Board of Anesthesiology and, and Pain Medicine. Uh, he's been awarded several honors throughout his career, including Best Doctors in America from 2001 to 18. He directs a chronic pain rotation for residents. He, he loves to teach. Uh, and, and I think that's what, what attracts uh, me most to him. I think I, I love teachers. 
Uh, he's an invited lecturer at the national, regional, and certainly university levels. His professional accomplishments are certainly too numerous to mention as all, most of our panel members today. So please take a look at his bio. I've been very fortunate to work with him for the last several years and have found him to exhibit the most important qualities in a clinician. He's, he's patient-centered. And while he's an excellent pain medicine doc and can do all sorts of things by himself, uh, I think uh, what I've learned is that what he enjoys most is practicing uh, as part of a team in this multidisciplinary effort that he's uh, put together down in, in Morgantown. And uh, besides being a, a, a father and a husband, um, I think that's what he likes to invest. And so I'll turn it over to Rick uh, to tell their story. And uh, let's go, Rick. Okay, thanks, Kevin. And uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak. Um, my goal here is sort of to, to lay out historically how we got to where we are today <clears throat> and hoping that some of the strategies and processes we use will transfer to some of you who are either starting uh, de novo or have partial programs and you'd like to, to help them get better. Next slide, please. So... We got started on our journey really in February of 2016 when a colleague of mine and I went to Dr. Marsh and presented to a panel of administrators regarding the concept of an integrated pain center that was housed under one roof and was multidisciplinary and integrated. And so you'll see later as we progress through these bullet points that we were unaware at the time that the DOD was even on the radar screen. Um, at that point, there was very rapid buy-in, and I have to say this was, this was a, in Italian we say fulmine, it's a strike of lightning. So it started immediately and it was like a chain reaction. So Dr. Marsh uh, created a steering committee which was to lead this and gave us the go ahead immediately. And so uh, we were looking to provide alternative treatments in order to decrease or eliminate the use of opioids and to transition that into a more comprehensive type of program. Initially, when we started this, we had two patient populations that I thought we would service. One was the patient population who um, was having chronic pain and had not yet been put on opioids. And the other population, given that we live in West Virginia, was a large group of patients who were already on opioids and needed either transitioned off or had never been given any other alternative to treatment. Shortly thereafter, we, at the university, West Virginia University, uh, uh, engaged with a research and development agreement with the Department of Defense and we met with those individuals, Kevin included, of course. And as he nicely summarized, we didn't want to reinvent the wheel. And as a matter of fact, as you referred to the, the naming, we were having a naming meeting and we were, we were bouncing around all these ideas. And finally, someone said, why don't we just call it WVU SIPM? And that was, an obvious, um, that was the obvious name from that point on. They gave us a lot of things that we use today, and they were very helpful in giving us a hand up to get to where we are much faster. And so you're gonna see a theme here that I'm in awe of, and that is how rapidly we progressed and how many, <clears throat> I guess you could say miracles occurred in a sequence to allow us to get where we are today. We are the leading edge regionally in pain care and particularly in integrated pain care. A lot of other places say that they do it within 100 miles of us, but a lot of that is outsourced and not comprehensive and, and co-located in one place. We've been called, and it, it sounds trite, but it's not. We're the Walmart of pain management in West Virginia. Certainly, the concept itself is innovative, but as we went on with, with um, designing and putting in place this uh, particular uh, clinic. Uh, and if you see at the top, it says opened in May 2017. So those of you that work in large organizations 
can do the math and see that we went from concept in February of 2016 to opening the doors in May of 2017, which is warp speed. And so when we started this, the steering committee said, if you, if you become a winner, people will be attracted to you. And I, I'm skeptical. And so as time went on, I realized this is clearly the truth. And so we became an innovator in treatment and research and teaching. We created some service lines like fast track spine care, which is for acute and subacute spine. If you have a patient who has a, a new back injury, uh, we'll see them within 72 hours and you'll see how we do that as we go through. And one of the first things that we, um, got and accepted graciously from the DOD was the DVPRS. Next slide, please. This is the WVU Medicine PRS. And so the point here to all of you who are looking for metrics is this is in the public domain. And they were very kind to allow us to usurp this and use it. Once they presented this to us, we adopted it the next day in the pain clinic. And I'm proud to say that in the last year, we've adopted it at WVU Hospital and all the clinics on the Morgantown campus now use the uh, WVU pain rating scale when it's appropriate for their patients. The important thing that I saw was that the, the day that we instituted this, the um, the measure of 12 or 14 out of 10 went completely away because this is functionally based. And so you can see it's a little bit small, but it's, it's essentially a 10 is there's nothing else in your life but this pain. So you really can't go beyond a 10, but more importantly, in the biopsychosocial model that Dr. Singh mentioned, it asks you about activity, sleep, mood, and stress. And so, I've learned over the past two and a half years that you can start to pattern read this. And by looking at the numbers, you can sort of tailor where you want to go with your history and physical and the type of treatments that you want to dial in for the patient. Uh, they've also shared with us battlefield acupuncture, uh, and that's useful. And we'll talk a little bit more about who does that here. The, uh, uh, WVU Medicine has a, an agreement with the uh, Special Forces, and they train Special Forces medics, and we have been become an ancillary to that. And one of the things that those guys love the most is what can I do that will keep my guys with, the, with their rifles pointed the right direction without any kind of intervention or medicine? And they ate up this battlefield acupuncture uh, with a spoon. And so within the last six months, we've trained about 10 advanced uh, special forces medics in battlefield acupuncture. They also were kind enough to, to share with us um, PASTOR, which is pain assessment screening tool and outcomes registry, which will become our outcomes measure over time. Right now through what's called the Rockefeller Neuroscience Institute at West Virginia University, we're working on a very sophisticated IT infrastructure, cloud-based, that this uh, measure will be placed. We've, we, every new patient gets it. Over time, it'll be able to be pushed out to patients before their next visits. And uh, there are some other very exciting ideas I hope I can come back and talk to in the future. Next, please. This is the group we have now. And so we started with pain medicine physicians and at the time of the, at the, at the origin, we had three. We now have seven. Uh, we have four full-time and three part-time. We have six advanced practice providers. We have three radiology techs going to four. We have two RNs and several LPNs. We have a cadre of medical assistants. We have two chiropractors who do acupuncture and battlefield acupuncture, and they are very popular. We have an exercise physiologist who you're going to hear about next. Uh, we have psychologists and social workers for testing and for therapy. We have an addiction psychiatrist who runs multiple suboxone clinics for chronic pain patients out of here at least one day a week. <clears throat> we have a massage therapist and a dietitian. For those of you who mentioned difficulty with insurance reimbursement, 
these two areas have been the biggest battle. And I'm very sad to say that the dietitian, which is the most critical part, is the least uh, reimbursed. It's a shame, and I think if I had a recommendation to insurers on the line, that when you measure return on investment, that you don't just look at cost, but you look at long-term savings. And so if, um, if for example, if, you're, if you have anything to do with renal disease, you see a dietitian. But if you're morbidly obese, which is a big problem in West Virginia, you can't see a dietitian or some uh, carriers allow you to see a dietitian one time. That obviously is not going to work. And, uh, and so what I would say is balance the cost of a program managed by a dietitian for weight loss or fitness and then measure that against the A1C or the blood pressure or the body mass index. And I think you'll see that you're, you're a winner. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the next case managers, insurance specialists. These, I believe, are the core of what we do. And I would recommend any of you that have the ability to have this within your clinic should get it. And then a whole slew of support staff who back us up. Um, financially, everyone's gonna say, well, how can we do this? Well, the, the way we do it is we leverage the, um, the revenue that we generate as a provider-based clinic with our interventions to pay for all these other services. There are several of these services, I would say more than half that are are cost neutral, but there are some obviously who are not, and that's what gives us the ability to do this. Next, please. A quick history about our building. Um, this was built uh, de novo in 2004, and this was the first place that we were moved into, and if you look to the right side, we occupied one half of the first floor. And um, on the other side was the first attempt of West Virginia University Medicine at um, uh, urgent care. And we proceeded that way. There was one pain physician, I'll give you three guesses who that was, and ultimately became two pain physicians. Um, and then as time went by and we got bigger and bigger, we ultimately then were able to expand into the whole first floor. There was a, a significant amount of expenditure, half a million dollars, um, that went into making the clinic better for us and more functional. We hired other doctors and we had a second procedure room and off we went. So you got your epidural and everything else was outsourced. If you got PT or if you got psych or if you got anything else, you had to leave and, and come back and report to us how you did. Not a very good way to do things. And if the shot didn't work then, and nothing else worked, or you were unwilling or unable to participate, uh, you got opioids. Uh, ultimately, in this last phase, there was an insurance company upstairs. And as I said, if you want to call it a miracle, in the beginning of February of 2016, their lease lapsed, and they gave up the top floor. And so we were able to take the top floor and make it into what it is today with very little outlay. Um, for renovations. Next, please. This group and the, the lovely young lady in the middle is Julianne, who you're going to hear, of, hear from right after me, and the two chiropractors. When we were given the charge to do this by Dr. Marsh and others, it had to be uh, exportable and scalable. And so what I did is created a modular system. And so this is the, these individuals in this picture are three of the four individuals in our neuromuscular module. And I saw a question come up about why not PTOT? And that has more to do with local politics. Um, but I, I'm going to go into some more things about that because in, within the concept of, of everybody follows a winner, we have picked up since the beginning um, uh, we've been approved for a pain fellowship. We have a fellowship program manager. We have a pharmacist uh, at the doctoral level who's a professor at the School of Pharmacy who's here one day a week. And we're bringing on a, a very well-known, nationally well-known physical therapist uh, who works primarily with back and neck pain and is very well written and will help us strengthen our research stance. Uh, next, please. 
This is a very large room, which we're very fortunate to have. It's our exercise room that you're gonna hear more about. This, believe it or not, um, and those of you that work with insurance companies won't have a hard time understanding this. This room, which is about 30 by 15, maybe a little bigger, was their conference room. Next, please. This is our massage therapist. Um, massage is not reimbursed by insurance for the most part. We have price pointed this so that it's very affordable for out of pocket. Uh, this gentleman has been doing massage for many years and he's very, um, very excited and energetic about what he does. He's a very good individual, very smart. Um, and so we price pointed this at a dollar a minute. So for 20 minutes, it costs you $20. And this is not your, your mama's spa massage. This is a medical massage for the purpose of uh, making you feel better and decreasing your pain and then concomitantly decreasing your opioid use. Um, we're also looking at things like we, we implement massage therapy immediately after trigger point injections. And although we haven't measured it, we empirically see a significant difference in the patients who have massage immediately after injection than those who don't. Next, please. <clears throat> this young lady is one of the core, I believe, that this place is built on. We have two case managers and we have two insurance specialists who really like what they're doing and are really good. These two ladies uh, in the case management section are the air traffic controllers. They keep the patients moving, they keep the patients coordinated to their visits. They coordinate because West Virginia is a geographically isolated state. Uh, multiple visits to various providers with only one trip to the clinic. One of the things that is a silver lining out of COVID is that this has leapfrogged us uh, just exponentially into the telemedicine uh, space. And so that is only going to help us in our exportable mission and our ability to reach areas of the state which are uh, far away from us. An easy example I always give is in our county, uh, the the biggest town that is west of us is 17 miles and 40 minutes away. Uh, because of roads and various other things, it's not easy to get to here. And so telemedicine has completely rocketed us over those uh, boundaries. And that's it. Next, please. And that's the end. And thank you again. Now, I think this is my, my role here. It, it's very exciting for me to introduce Julianne Spini, who's our, our exercise physiologist. And <clears throat> we went the exercise physiologist route because of some contractual and political uh, boundaries that we couldn't overcome. And in order to overcome them, it would have taken too much time. And we were, we were in a very much of a hurry to get this going. Julianne is energetic, she's innovative, she is a master of science in exercise science, and she's certified in, um, uh, as a corrective exercise specialist. And she is uh, one of our stars. So it's happy for me to turn this over to Julianne. Thank you, Dr. V. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? So as Dr. Vagliani said, my name is Julianne Spini. I'm the exercise physiologist at the WVU Medicine Center for Integrative Pain Management, and I oversee the movement therapy department. Next slide, please. So these are just some key points we're gonna talk about today. Um, the use of functional rehabilitation for the chronic pain patient, the use of um, functional rehab in telemedicine during the COVID-19 pandemic, and then the use of movement therapy and other um, neuromuscular services for stress, um, physical stress reduction for frontline healthcare workers. Next slide, please. Okay, so as we all know, when we experience pain, 
there are changes at multiple levels of the motor system, which in turn causes a redistribution of these signals between and within muscles. And ultimately, this causes changes in our mechanical behavior. So short-term benefit of this, obviously, is it protects us. Um, but when these things don't kind of go back to quote unquote normal, um, we have long-term consequences which cause dysfunctional movement. And that's where um, movement therapy comes into play. Next slide, please. Okay. So our first objective, like I said, is the use of these functional rehabilitations for the chronic pain patient. And we at CIPM here define that as movement therapy, which is actually based in exercise therapy and functional rehab. So there are two main focuses in movement therapy, and those are physical fitness, which encompasses um, the body's ability to carry out our daily tasks with vigor, alertness, um, without undue fatigue, and with ample energy to enjoy our leisure time pursuits, as well as meet these unforeseen emergencies we um, have during the day. And those are implemented through um, exercise to affect our physical activity. And then our second focus is our functionality. And we look at these through the principles of identify, create, correct, and achieve. And those particularly are looking at screening individuals to identify their limitations through um, their compensations, which I use the overhead squat assessment for with its modifications. And then I go in to customize a workout because everybody's indi individual, so we wanna make sure that we're customizing to that particular person. And I utilize the corrective exercise continuum, which I'll touch on in a few slides. And with that, I take the patient and then we perform these corrective exercises. And in turn, that we want to resolve is to achieve. Um, we're boosting physical performance and preventing a further decline in the patient. And then there are three phases to functionality, how we kind of take them through the program. Um, I just want to point out, everybody does start at a different phase. Like I said, we're all individuals, so you could start at, you know, be starting at phase two instead of phase one, um, et cetera, but that is evaluated appropriately. And then um, those phases are functional movement, functional performance, and functional skill. So within phase one, there are actually two stages. Um, the first stage being mobility and stability. And this is where we're looking to really improve their posture, their joint stability and mobility, their core stability, their muscular imbalances, and then also introducing um, an initial psychological adaptation to exercise. So I like to really um, use my resources and refer outwardly to our behavioral medicine specialists in this case. Um, and then we kind of want to move them into um, phase one, stage two, which we're um, working on more of movement. So we're developing a dynamic balance. We're developing mobile stability and stable mobility. And then we're also developing the five um, primary movements, which are the bend and lift, which is like a squat, um, single leg activities, such as pivoting, um, pushing, pulling, and rotational movements. And then we wanna progress them into stage two, um, or phase two, which is performance and load um, centered. So we're looking to actually train uh, their muscular force production, they're maintaining a dynamic warm-up, which we developed in phase one, and also training movement with external loads. This can be through like resistance training, um, weighted resistance bands, things like that, um, that they can do at home to accomplish more so muscular endurance and strength, muscular hypertrophy, maximal strength, and then also touching on some body composition. And then we want to progress them into phase three, which is skill. And I kind of call this the accent, the cherry on top. We're really focusing and honing in on activity and event specific training. Um, most patients don't kind of go too much into the speed and agility and quickness um, part of this, but um, they will touch more so into that activity and event specific training. Next slide, please. Okay, so where does corrective exercise kind of fit into our fitness and rehab pillars? Um, it's actually the foundation 
for everything, um, for functional safe and efficient movement. Corrective um, exercise is correcting imbalances to reduce the risk of injury and improve performance potential. And then we also at SIPM touch into a little bit more of total health, which we're learning and using proper joint functions, um, increasing that mobility and stability as needed, um, developing muscular endurance, and then also looking to implement other types of programming for their general health. This may involve um, chiropractic care, which is not limited to uh, manipulation. It could be Graston, it could be uh, battlefield acupuncture, massage therapy, as well as um, registered dietary services. Next slide, please. So this is the corrective exercise continuum I mentioned about um, when we look to create a program as an exercise physiologist. Um, the four points there, the four I call them the blocks to a corrective exercise are to inhibit, to lengthen, to activate, and to integrate. Now when we do our evaluation, like I said, we're looking for these compensations and those actually break down um, into overactive and underactive musculature. Um, from a neuromuscular standpoint, we want to utilize all four of these areas, um, different doses for different people. Um, and we also, like I said, may get involved with the chiropractic care with massage therapy um, to help us along, especially in the inhibitory phases and lengthening techniques we would like to use. And I come in a little bit more with activation and integration, um, but I'm also teaching them how they can do some of these inhibitory and lengthening techniques at home as well to kind of maintain in between treatments. Next slide, please. So why is corrective exercise important? So the National Academy of Sports Medicine um, gives us three values and uses. One, it's going to offer a recovery workout. So for patients, this is movement pattern correction. This is recovery and self-care, so adapting. Two, it's gonna restore and encourage proper movement. Um, technique and longevity improvement are very important in my room. If anybody knows me, um, technique, I'm always on people about their technique. Um, and their return to play, so specificity and rebalancing their life. Return to play for these types of patients um, could be you know, returning to being a little bit more active with their grandkids sitting on a chair for an extended period of time to maybe enjoy um, you know, a luncheon, things like that. And three, um, it actually prepares the body for high, low volume to intensity changes. So wrapping that up, it's movement preparation. That's a lot of spinal stability, a lot of core stability, so that they're able to perform um, well and move dynamically. And I gave an example about like walking up the stairs. So it's gonna prepare your body to be able to move. Next slide, please. So the second objective I wanted to talk to you about today is how do we raise the bar? How do we take all those good things with movement therapy and apply them um, to telemedicine during this COVID-19 pandemic? So this, um, these pictures are just showing how a patient um, sets up a telemedicine appointment and executes that appointment. Um, some big things to take away from this are that therapeutic exercise programming, um, this telemedicine gives me the chance to be able to create and monitor patients one-on-one. Um, -on -one. It's great to be able to actually use this now and then into the future for those types of patients that may live more than an hour and a half to two hours away. And that'll be able, I'll be able to check on them more frequently than maybe once a month, which is wonderful to be able to, to do that in person, but it kind of gives them a homework that they have to follow through with. And then the self-service, I like my patients to be, um, take active roles in their care. So um, I actually give them a home exercise program that has a video link and I can actually check when they link in and when they um, are doing their exercises as well. Next slide, please. And then the last objective we, I just wanted to show you was um, call to action. So movement therapy or exercise therapy um, is not limited to just the inpatient population. Um, it was nice to be able to even use my skills as well as my 
um, other colleagues to join in um, to offer services of chiropractic, massage, um, and exercise therapy services to the WVU Medicine employees on the front lines during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, this was nice to just be able to take away some physical stresses they may have been experiencing due to the incre increased um, workloads. Next slide, please. And just to kind of wrap up, um, some key takeaways I want to leave you with, um, five different ones. The first one being, we're always working for function. Two is you want to start low um, and slow and gradually grow. Three, you want to encourage proper movement patterns to minimize as much as dysfunctions as you can. Four, we want to utilize all of our resources to reach patients for in-person and or um, telemedicine visits. So we can utilize both at the same time, um, intermixing or one or the other. And five, we want to help the patient to adapt, to specify and rebalance and prepare for movement. And this is just not limited to um, the functional pyramid I have on the left of corrective exercise, but this could also be, like I said, making appropriate referrals, um, injection therapy, medication therapy, behavioral medicine, chiropractic, massage, um, and behavioral, like I said, behavioral medicine, is, I think is a big piece of this um, functional pyramid too. Next slide. And thank you very much. Well, that was fantastic. And, and, and certainly what what we needed to hear, I, I have a few questions for uh, the group, and I'll, I'm going to target Dr. Marsh first. Um, you know, the impact of COVID on, on those who, will, we won't call them niche um, areas that in, in medicine, uh, we've, you know, it, there was a, a will and the, the resources that you put together to target the, the opioid and pain issues in the state. Uh, do you foresee with COVID that that's going to be negatively impacted uh, by, by available resources that may draw away from this? Or is this part of that COVID response uh, for the state? Well, <clears throat> thank you, uh, Kevin. That's a great question. Uh, I think that we need to incorporate um, our approaches and innovate our approaches you know, related to the COVID pandemic. You know, it's interesting to me that there's, a, there's an author that I really like on, on the COVID crisis, a guy named Thomas Puyo, who's written a series of articles in the medium, and he talks about the hammer and the dance. And the hammer is suppress and get people to stay inside and reduce the rate of spread or the R naught level, the R sub zero level, the reproduction, sort of how many people does an infected person infect. But he talks about the dance. And the dance is, as we come back out, instead of fighting COVID and instead of seeing COVID as the enemy, we need to learn to live with the COVID pandemic for right now. Certainly, we're all very hopeful that uh, a combination drug therapy like remdesivir or maybe some others might be effective in reducing the life-threatening complications of COVID, which seem to be changing a lot as COVID moves around the world, um, or a, and or a vaccine. But we know that care must go on. You know, fear is part of the pain experience and, and we want to make sure both for our patients and as I suggested earlier, our providers, that we are um, uh, approaching that syndrome of pain and, and, and you know, and, and fear um, so that we can help make sure that we are providing the right environment to deliver the best care and help all involved. But thank you for that question. Uh, Rick and Julianne, I, I'm, I see a couple of questions. I'm certainly curious, uh, you know, building that, the SIPM down there, sort of putting everything in one place, certainly that, that sounds very patient-centered. It, it also sounds very efficient to sort of navigate the, the many modalities and uh, assessments that are required for complex uh, pain patients. So from your perspective, uh, how, have, how has that allowed you to make the case on a return on investment and the improvement uh, to patients having that all in, all in one environment? And what has the patient response been to that versus people hitting you after a series of 10 or 11 appointments going around the campus, uh, visiting different specialties 
uh, for different assessments? Um, <clears throat> that's a broad question, but I'll try to, to chop out some of the pieces. First of all, West Virginians are very family centered. And so well, Morgantown's a very small town, but for some of these individuals to come to Morgantown is like driving into downtown Manhattan. And so this telemedicine has really, I mean, it's, it is, uh, I can tell you some stories, you know, I've, I've seen patients while they're in the drive-in line at Chick-fil-A. Um, I've seen them when they're babysitting or when they're putting their dog out. Uh, but they really took to this. And the other thing they took to that I was stunned about is the wellness core that this is built around. And so it was a transfer of care from what do you, and I saw this as a topic, what are you going to do for me as opposed to what can I do for myself to help me get better? And they, the population here has really, really uh, taken hold of that. And the other thing is about being attracted to a winner, even though we can't, we don't really right now have the capabilities to show the true return on investment, insurers who have actuaries who do numbers all day have paid attention. And some have approached us and, and asked us for certain ideas and services. And, and I'm hopeful I'll hear some more things about that in the, in the next presentations in the next day so that we can move forward with some of our state insurers and our private insurers to partner with them in a, in a very positive way. And I'll turn it over to Julianne. I think, well, return investment is, we see that pretty common every day with just people keep coming in the door. They believe in what we're doing. Um, like Dr. Vagliani said, very family oriented um, and people want to know, you know, what can they, do for themselves, be active in your care is a huge thing that I preach time and time again. And people just bite at it like it's bait <laughs> on, a, on a fishing pole. But it's, it's definitely, um, like he said, Morgantown is a centered, fam very family centered community. And you wouldn't think that, but it definitely is. And me being originally from Pennsylvania, um, coming in, this is my second year I've been here. And it's, it's exactly what I wanted it to be. It was very family centered, very collaborative take on healthcare. You know, a, a lot of what you all do uh, to reach these patients and to be effective with them involves the, the touch, the, you know, the healing touch of, of getting together, being in the room with the provider, the massage therapist, other modalities that you all uh, have available. You know, are, what are your concerns with the forced uh, movement to the, the telemedicine, we will lose some of that, even though it, it, it is intriguing uh, to, to work that way. Uh, what are your concerns with the increased use and requirement to use uh, telehealth and virtual health to reach out to your patients? Well, that's a great question. We're, we're in the infancy here, although we were cast into that um, like we were thrown in the deep end on this. So certainly following up patients, um, the behavioral medicine specialties and our behavioral medicine hospital here have been doing telemedicine group therapy and individual therapy for quite some time. So as you mentioned before, we don't like to recreate things that are already created. So we call them up and say, how are you doing this? And our people started doing it immediately. We asked them, what's your spacing for group therapy in anticipation of going back to on-site visits? Um, we're creating our own methods and processes for hands-on medicine. You know, I wish there were telemedicine trigger points and telemedicine epidurals, but there aren't. And so one of the things that's been a selling point is to reach some of these areas in the middle of the state, which were pretty much inaccessible and they and and the patient had no access to us have now gone away and one of the great selling points is to say look you only have to come here if you need something that only can be done here but everything else can be done via telemedicine or at least for the time being via telephone um, and it is incredible at the buy-in and even 
relatively technologically unsavvy individuals have jumped all over this. It's, it's very, very exciting. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. I, I don't think it's taken away um, any vibrancy, I guess, that you would feel in the room with a provider. Um, I think people can connect just as well across a screen, um, just trying to be safe. <laughs> And as Dr. V said, it, it's people have latched onto this because it's more convenient for them, especially now and in the future when they live very extremely far away from the clinic, um, coming in, you know, when needed or periodically, um, and then doing telemedicine in between can be just as effective. Um, just personally for me, I'm able to watch people do their exercises, critique, evaluate, uh, make changes and refer outwardly if I need to to my other um, colleagues if it's appropriate. So I, th I think that people really like this because of the conveniency. One more quick thing, Kevin, about this with respect, to, tele with respect to telemedicine is that it also, um, you require less space. So where we might have needed four or five or six more exam rooms, if we judiciously assign telemedicine visits, uh, we, can, we can save that cost or we can delay that cost. And so that's a positive that I see as a director that maybe the other providers don't see. Well, excellent. We're, we're a little over on purpose. We wanted to bleed into the break. Uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna go to break now and we'll see you all starting at uh, 20 after the hour. So see you all soon. Thank you to the panel. And another quick reminder as you're going to break, any questions that you submitted, and thank you so much for the great questions. They will get answered and we will share the answers with you. So we see them all from you and thank you. And we'll, we'll get to those and share them after the symposium.